Is that my phone? No. He's going to talk about sustainable concrete and how it can make a real difference. Dr. Van Dam is a principal at NCE working in Nevada with over 35 years of civil engineering experience specializing in pavement design and evaluation, forensic investigations, material assessment, sustainability, and resiliency. Dr. Van Dam is a co-principal investigator on the Federal Highway Administration's Sustainable Pavements Program. And in total, he has published over 100 technical articles and is a frequent presenter on pavements, pavement materials, and sustainability. Welcome, Tom Van Dam. Thank you, Nathan. I assume you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. And it looks like your presentation is up on the screen as it should be. And so with that, I will duck out until you're about wrapped up. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Well, greetings, people. Um, let's hopefully this will advance. All right. Let's. Yep. Seems to be working good. I hope everyone's doing OK. Uh, I want to echo what Charles says. I think uh, Remo has been a little bit of a learning curve for me and, and I think for others, but overall a uh, much better experience than what I think many of us are used to experiencing with Zoom and Teams. So kudos uh, to Charles, I, or actually I think it was Nathan's idea to give this a try. Um, basically, I'm gonna be talking about uh, sustainable uh, concrete. Uh, the emphasis might be on pavements because that's where most of my work is, is in, but um, I think that uh, will apply to all uh, concrete. Uh, what's interesting is this uh, particular slide uh, was in this presentation the last time I gave it. And that was in uh, 2016 on November 10th at the NICC. And as I recycled that old presentation, I added only the, the last bullet on this one to update what's going on in Nevada. But I basically uh, was after the last election and I had politicians come and go Administrations change, but scientific facts remain. And I think uh, many of us may feel that that has been challenged over um, maybe recent history when it comes to climate change, but uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic are, are continuing to melt at alarming rates. Uh, sea level rise is continuing and is, is recognized as a major resiliency issue for a lot of uh, coastal cities. You know, we are seeing acidification and uh, death, uh, dying coral reefs within oceans. Poison ivy still is becoming more and more potent. And, uh, you know, some storms. I, I think we just had uh, Hurricane Iota, uh, Category 5, actually hit uh, Central America this last uh, few days ago. Latest uh, occurring named storm in, uh, in history. So um, the slide is still good. Uh, I think sustainable um, practices are simply good engineering. It's something that I think we all want to... Uh, to do. It just makes economic sense, it makes environmental sense, and it makes uh, societal or social sense. And uh, without question, the emphasis on greenhouse uh, gases under the Trump administration, the emphasis was reduced. But uh, it is uh, important to note that Nevada Climate Initiative, which just came out um, within the last couple months, I believe, they actually have some fairly aggressive uh, goals, uh, one of which is a, uh, I believe, a 20% reduction of greenhouse gases to uh, compared to 2005 levels by the year 2025. So this is a very relevant topic for Nevada. So what we're looking for are really these sweet spot type items uh, where we can go right to the middle and uh, try to find that uh, intersection between economic growth, social progress, and environmental stewardship. Uh, I think it's important when we think of pavement sustainability or sustainability within concrete. It is really aspirational goal. I think we all recognize the challenges in front of us, but it's uh, all a matter of stepping forward. We're trying to achieve engineering objectives, uh, preserve, and really ideally restore ecosystems. Uh, we want to make wise use of our financial, uh, human environmental capital. And we really want to focus on meeting human needs such as health, safety, equity, employment, comfort, and ultimately happiness. And I think we can all need a little bit of happiness these days. When we think of sustainability, an essential concept is the life cycle. And so we don't think of any single one phase. We have to think about how all of the phases 
interact from design to materials to construction. A lot of times we want to stop there, but we need to think about operations in the use phase, uh, how we're going to maintain, preserve, rehabilitate what we have constructed. And ultimately, at end of life, what, what happens with those materials, they should then become usable uh, within that existing piece of infrastructure or in some other way going forward. So this whole circle of life concept is very much uh, pivotal or foundational to sustainability. So starting with um, basically what I want to talk about today, I'm going to touch a bit on design. I'm going to spend most of my time, I think, on wise use of materials. Uh, we'll talk a, a little bit about the use phase uh, and then uh, end with verification. And so really when we think about efficiency in design, we, we have to challenge ourselves as an industry not to do the same thing that we have done over and over and over again. I can't even tell you how many times I hear, well, we've always done it this way. And what we really ought to be doing is opening ourselves up to whatever field we're in into looking at new opportunities. Uh, we've heard a number of them today. We've heard about Tyler speaking of optimizing concrete mixtures. We've heard um, the last speaker, Charles, uh, talking about the use of fiber reinforced concrete. These are material opportunities for improvement, but these also exist within design. Uh, possible uh, consideration of mechanistic design is, is one element where we can better focus our designs for uh, the context of, uh, of what we have. But uh, there, there's other opportunities that may exist. We need to consider the life cycle, as I just mentioned, we need to really be looking at embracing innovation, not being uh, comfortable in, in what we've always have done is the correct way to go about it. And then I think it's really important to design to maintain. Um, we, we, can, we should not be making decisions in design or construction that really minimize our ability to um, maintain into the future and ultimately to recycle into the future. One example, and this I, I had many, but I, I cut a lot of slides out, but I think an intriguing idea is uh, this idea of TC pavements. These are uh, basically, uh, we've heard similar uh, discussions today about uh, joint spacing with overlays, but instead of going to our 12 foot by 15 foot panels, we may go to six by six or four by four foot panels and because of that, we significantly reduce the stress induced in the slab. This technology is starting to really catch on amongst distribution centers and amongst some uh, private uh, clientele. Uh, it's a Chilean design, and it has a, a fairly robust uh, theoretical basis behind it and good performance. So something uh, that we can look at that would use less materials uh, with uh, similar performance to conventional design. Moving on to materials and mixtures, uh, what we need to consider in this is from the point of extraction and all the way through production and transportation. And then um, really this takes us from cradle to gate. So this takes us up to the point of construction. It includes mixture proportioning and concrete plant operations. Uh, we start with clinker, which is this here. It comes out of a cement kill. We look at uh, the combination with calcium sul sulfate or gypsum. Uh, we look at aggregates, and then we look at plant operations. And so this is uh, the initial part of my talk. We'll focus on this. In this process, there's an active role for uh, recycled and reclaimed aggregates. Some of these may be, uh, some have experimented with reclaimed asphalt pavement. Uh, recycled concrete aggregates, uh, air-cooled blast furnace slag are all aggregate sources that have been uh, reclaimed that have been used within uh, concrete and may have application in different uh, applications. On-site recycling uh, is probably something that definitely needs to be considered. Uh, often people want to recycle. They want to tear something out, move it someplace, crush it, grade it and bring it back. But what you find is if you can actually 
do the crushing operation on grade. And this, this is, uh, I believe, Illinois Tollway. Uh, this is actually from Colorado, the entrance road to DIA, where uh, by eliminating the uh, transportation, there's significant savings in greenhouse gases and other environmental impacts. Now we're doing fairly well, I think, on uh, with flexible pavements with roadbed mod, but this is something to consider on any of our uh, projects where instead of hauling material away, crushing and bringing it back, maybe bringing the crusher out to the site. When we start to look at really where our, our major savings are going to occur, it's going to be within the hydraulic cement, uh, uh, within hydraulic cement and, and the concrete mixtures themselves. Hydraulic uh, cement concrete, uh, Portland cement concrete is the most commonly used material on the planet by humankind aside from water. So roughly a cubic yard of concrete per person per year is manufactured and placed annually. This has a very large economic, environmental and social impacts. Uh, these impacts are both positive and then negative, and that's the nature of impacts. That uh, this is this is a big industry; it has a big footprint. Uh, in the United States, in 2019, there was 88.5 million metric tons of Portland cement produced, uh, roughly equivalent to probably close to 80. You know, uh, well, it depends on how the cement was blended, but this is linked to. 0.6% of our greenhouse gas production within the US. So the uh, 2018 numbers showed uh, 40.3 million metric tons of uh, greenhouse gas production linked to the uh, 606, 6677 million metric tons of cement produced according to EPA. And within highways, pavements, or within uh, pavements, paved roads, roughly about 5% of the US cement is used. So it's a big impact. When we look at how it breaks down, when we look at clinker, what you will see is that if we go to the acquisition phase for the raw materials, very little energy and CO2 emissions are really tied up with uh, either all of the concrete making materials, the aggregate, the cement, everything. So the, the mining, the quarrying, the crushing, the transporting of the aggregates to the plant have a very, very small footprint. When we start to look at footprint, it's when things, uh, when we take the clay and the limestone and introduce it into the kiln and we start to burn it, uh, you can see a fairly high uh, amount of energy, roughly three quarters of the energy in the entire uh, process of delivering a cubic yard of concrete to the gate is tied up in kill fuel burning. The reactions uh, lead though, that's roughly 37% of the, of the greenhouse gases. The largest portion of greenhouse gases are actually coming from taking uh, calcium carbonate, which is limestone, heating it up and calcining it and driving off the CO2 so that we're left with calcium oxide. That's roughly 46.3% of all the greenhouse gases associated with that concrete at the gate is coming right there. So this is the, really the, the majority of what happens. Concrete production itself, you will see, is down less than 10% is occurring at the, at the plant uh, and then transporting it. So roughly, if we look at a typical Portland cement concrete at the gate that might have a six sack mix, we might have up to 0.26 tons of, of, of CO2 or greenhouse gases, uh, CO2 equivalents associated with that cubic yard. Roughly 0.24 tons of that is associated with the Portland cement itself. Well, that sounds pretty dramatic, but when we look at concrete on a spectrum with other building materials, you will see on a mass basis, concrete is actually fairly low in embodied CO2 and embodied energy. It just has a lot of mass. You know, things like plywood, you can see, which many will consider to be a very green source of building, can be extremely high. Glue laminated timbers 
these are, are very high both in embodied CO2 and in embodied energy. But even that being the case is because we use so much of it, it has such a big impact. So how can we reduce that impact? And it is, again, critical for industry to do this. There's really uh, three major strategies to do it, and they, they all work together. One is to reduce the clinker, that little grayish, dark gray nodule coming out of the end of the cement kiln, reduce the amount of that that's within the, the cement itself. The second strategy is to reduce the amount of cementitious materials within a cubic yard of concrete. You know, for example, we can go from uh, 611 pounds plus of uh, cementitious uh, down to 500, and I'll talk about that in Nevada in a moment. This is very context sensitive, and, and, and Tyler did a great job talking about how this can be done, but he also pointed out that for certain types of applications like pumping concrete, we do need more paste than we would for something like slip form paving. And then reduce the concrete over to life is improved design. I like this idea of elegance in design, uh, where we uh, more elegantly design our, our structure so that we may need less uh, concrete. This could even be the use of something like fibers. Again, looking at what the uh, carbon, uh, embodied carbon would be on those fibers. And then really improving durability to make sure that what we build lasts. So with regards to reducing clinker content, um, basically we've already been doing this for a lot of years through the use of SEMs. Uh, we have not made uh, dramatic use of bl uh, blended cements uh, within Nevada, but I, I know that some has been introduced. Uh, these ASTM C595 uh, type uh, 1P cements, for example. Uh, I think we'll start to maybe see some 1S cements in which we might have 35 to 40% slag at a mu uh, much higher uh, replacement level. And uh, we can um, add this at the plant. And that's actually the most common way where a supplier will have a silo filled with a uh, uh, maybe a type 2, 5 Portland cement and then have a silo filled with a natural pozzolan or a, a slag and then blend it at the plant. The other way, and one that I think that we're going to see more emphasis in the coming years, is through inner grinding limestone into the clinker and selling a, a blended cement as an ASTM C595 type 1L. Uh, we can add up to 15% uh, by standard. Practically, the limit is around 12%. Uh, it is allowed uh, currently in the RTC uh, uh, Northern Nevada Orange Book, which is wonderful. Uh, but right now it's not uh, uh, allowed within the uh, Nevada DOT spec. Although it is in the spec in, in many places around the country. And uh, the Portland Cement Association, if you're curious, has a whole website on, on this right now. Uh, regarding supplementary cementitious materials, we have fly ash, uh, which is a byproduct of burning coal. Uh, it's collected from the flue gases. I think those of you right now who are hearing this presentation and are producing concrete or specking concrete all recognize that this is becoming in shorter and shorter supply. Uh, regardless of what was done to try to bolster the um, burning of coal, coal just is not as cost effective as it used to be in comparison to alternative means of producing power. And we are, as we diversify our power grid and move towards more renewables. Uh, we are seeing less and less fly ash on the market here. And what happened in Southern Nevada that was dramatic was the closing of the Navajo power plant. So it's something that we um, <clears throat> are seeing a lot of pressure on availability of fly ash. Uh, slag cement is, is filling some of that gap. Uh, we are seeing importation of slag cement actually coming in from Asia into ports in California and being shipped into the Reno market. And I think we will see more of that. It's a, a wonderful product. It's a byproduct of the production of pig iron in a iron blast furnace uh, in which they uh, quench the, the molten slag uh, in what's called a granulator. And then they grind it fine and it is uh, cementitious and uh, puzzle properties. Uh, natural puzzle are something that Northern Nevada is quite familiar with. 
Uh, we have used them for a long time. Uh, they can be calcined clays, they can be volcanic ashes, pumices and uh, di diabetaceous earth and other sources. Uh, but they are natural materials and, and can be variable. So often they do require some additional uh, processing. At a minimum, they have to be ground. When we look at CO2 replacement uh, for clinker and, uh, with SEMs, or we look at the yeah, cement replacement with uh, SEMs, we can see 100% um, Portland cement might have uh, this many uh, kilograms per meter uh, cubed uh, of CO2, uh, oh, sorry, this would be uh, tons of CO2 per uh, kilograms of um, meter cubed concrete. But as we move down with something like silica fume, down to maybe a blend of 70% uh, Portland cement, 27% fly ash, 3% silica fume in a ternary system, all the way down, we can see significant reduction. It cut our, our carbon footprint for our cement in half through judicious use of SEMs. Typical replacement levels that we see in many of our uh, structures, especially slab on grade, for like a class F fly ash natural pozzolan are 15 to 25%. This is a good range for uh, mitigating alkali silica reactivity and helping us with sulfate attack. Uh, class C ashes in markets where it's available can go higher but they are not very effective. And matter of fact, it makes things like alkali silica reactivity and sulfate attack worse. Slag cement, we can replace at a higher level, 25 to 50%. And when we move to mass concrete placements, piers, uh, foundations, these kind of things, uh, they have been uh, effective in replacing up to 85% of clinker with SEM, combinations of SEMs in structures, the I-35W bridge over the Mississippi River in Minneapolis is one example. And as I mentioned, these blended cements are available. We can get them uh, pre-blended with uh, uh, pozzolan, a, a F-ash or natural pozzolan uh, with slag, with a limestone uh, or blends of those uh, materials. So these are something that the cement suppliers would provide. They would balance the, the chemistry make sure that this would function in a way uh, suitable and very similarly to uh, a normal type uh, 2 5 cement. Uh, one interesting note is a type 1L will immediately have the ability to reduce our carbon footprint by 10 to 12 percent. So if we're striving for some fairly dramatic reductions in our carbon footprint, uh, we can do that with a type 1L cement and this shows the basis for why the 15 percent and what you see is basically when we get to around 15% of replacement of uh, Portland limestone cement, we're about equivalent in, in strength gain um, and, uh, and other factors that we get with a, a, a type one cement. And so they really kind of balance, it's really about 12% is, is where the, uh, you're buying them at right in this area here. And there should effectively be almost no difference in behavior uh, as far as workability and um, strength gain. And actually, your SEMs become more effective with Portland limestone cements. Uh, there have been a couple of projects already constructed up in northern Nevada with uh, type 1L cements. The uh, foundation uh, for the Tracy Generating Station is one. Uh, also, sidewalks in Spanish Springs. So already it's, it's coming into market in, uh, up in Northern Nevada. So when we look at uh, what's going to be necessary to, um, to then move to the next stage, which is to reduce the cementitious content, Tyler Lay has already presented and done a wonderful job in doing that. What we need to do is get more aggregate into the mix through an optimized gradation, allowing us to, to take the cementitious to paste out. Uh, we want to make sure we have very good aggregates when we do this. Um, as, as I think has been already talked about yesterday on the Spaghetti Bowl Express, the porous aggregates do require special handling. And we have to have durable aggregates. We've got to mitigate ASR. We've got to make sure that we have freestyle durability. You saw this this morning, the tarantula curve. I do think it does look quite a bit like a tarantula. 
Uh, but this is a, a very, very effective means to optimize our, our, our gradations, allowing us to reduce our semititious contents while still having the workability, which Tyler stressed is the most important parameter because that allows us to mix, uh, transport, place, consolidate, and finish our concrete. Uh, and it will allow us then to move from like six sack mixes or seven and a half sack mixes all the way down to realistically for most paving applications, probably we, we uh, in Southern Nevada, especially, we could be around 500 pounds of total cementitious. So in a combination of replacing clinker with SCMs and then reducing our cementitious materials content in our concrete, we can see these dramatic decreases in our carbon footprint while all having similar workability, similar strength gain, uh, possibly enhanced durability. I'm gonna stress this, I know Tyler said it this morning, increasing cement content does not increase strength. If you take a mix and hold your water content constant and then change your cement content, yes, but it's not the increase in cement that's cementitious that's doing it, it's the fact that you have increased the uh, water cement ratio at your lowest cement content. If we hold water to cementitious ratio constant, we will find almost no impact beyond a certain point of increasing the cementitious content of those mixtures. So our challenge is to throw away the three-point curve as we're currently doing it, and then move instead to build an aggregate, an optimized aggregate gradation, and then put enough paste in there to ensure workability uh, to get strength. An example, this is our data from Project Neon. Uh, the mixes in blue had 500 pounds cubic yard total uh, cementitious. The ones in red had the minimum currently required by NDOT standards of 611. These are the three day strengths. The red line represents the 550, which is the opening to traffic roll. And you can see some of the, uh, basically, in this case, the higher cementitious contents did a little bit better, but I would also stress that those were in July versus February through May, hotter temperatures. By 10 day, almost no difference. By 28 day, on average, absolutely no difference. And probably the, the lower one uh, was, was, as, was possibly higher average, but not statistically so. But look at these strengths down in this area here in Las Vegas. This uh, had a manufactured sand. If we uh, had a blended sand or a natural sand, we could have done even better, but the strengths are amazing uh, at how high they are. So looking at the use phase, uh, basically things I just wanna stress here very quickly are fuel efficiency is correlated to smoothness. I, 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 I love John Donovan. Uh, uh, yeah, Donovan's uh, presentations earlier from Missouri, talking about their IRI values, how they built their pavement smooth and kept them smooth. So we really need to be um, working very hard to make sure that, uh, that we have smoothness during construction. Part of that is mixes that don't slump. Part of it might be stringless uh, technologies for paving. Uh, use diamond grinding probably earlier uh, than normally we would. And uh, that really helps our fuel efficiency for all of our vehicles, and it is significant. Uh, Stormwater issues in urban environments, we can use uh, pervious surfaces to help there. And then other uh, considerations include safety, aesthetics, urban heat island. I'm not gonna spend uh, any time beyond this on that, but there's a lot that we can do with concrete that uh, can help us uh, meet all of these goals. I thought this was just interesting. This is from California, where they actually looked at um, higher traffic volume pavements, and they did calculations of vehicle fuel consumption, and they set different trigger values for when we should be making them smoother. And you will see for the lower volume pavements, don't even worry about it, or very high levels of IRI at 177, but for uh, medium to high traffic volume, they found that even at 101, we ought to be keeping below that limit if we can. 
Uh, the final thing I'm going to cover is uh, verification. Uh, there are assessment tools uh, to look at economic, like in life cycle cost analysis, environmental, and societal impacts. And we ought to be considering over the entire life cycle, not just initial costs. It isn't enough just to reduce your carbon footprint as delivered uh, if that doesn't last or doesn't perform. Uh, tools are under development. Uh, environmental product declarations are coming online. And the FHWA has a, uh, a new life cycle assessment tool that is coming out that I'll talk about a little bit more. I put up Ronald Reagan here because uh, I miss that guy these days. And uh, trust but verify, one of uh, his famous uh, sayings. And I, I think that's what we need to be doing moving forward with sustainability. We must avoid greenwashing. Uh, assessing it, there's uh, a number of rating systems that are available. Uh, a number of states are looking at them. Uh, I think that these are, are, are good things to embrace. Ultimately, I think we're, we're going to need to move to some of these life cycle assessment tools where we actually do an environmental accounting over multiple impact categories to see how our choices impact um, the overall environmental, uh, you know, our, impact our choice, you know, how our choices impact the environment. This is an example that we wrote up for Federal Highways in a, in a case study. Uh, it's the access road to DIA in Denver, Colorado. Uh, basically, uh, we compared a typical California DOT mix uh, right here, which has, what, 565 pounds, so roughly a six sack mix, against an optimized mix that was actually used on the job. Uh, this mix contained a Portland limestone cement, uh, and then basically it was an optimized gradation for, uh, to allow the reduction in paste content. There was other features to look at, uh, a remove and replace option, which would be kind of business as usual, a, a rubbleization where the, the uh, existing concrete was rubbleized in place and used as a base. This pavement suffered very severe ASR, and then a reconstruct option. Uh, in which uh, various, uh, you know, some of it was bringing back recycled material. When you looked at a life cycle assessment result, comparing the option on each category with the highest becomes 100%, far and above that option two, where it was a combination of reducing the cement content, using a Portland limestone cement, and then building upon a recycled base that was recycled in place dramatically and significantly reduced the impact over these are just a smattering i think we checked 14 impact categories but ozone depletion global warming smog ecotoxicity fossil fuel uh, depletion water resource depletion those ones i just selected just dramatic reductions uh, across all these categories and so i think this is the only uh tool Ultimately, that will give us this a uh, broad picture of our choices. So in summary, you know, sustainable concrete uh, practices, they are available for all concrete structures at all phases of life. Concrete uh, gets a bad rap. Everybody will focus in. Uh, numbers that they'll quote, I quoted numbers from the EPA at 0.5%. Greenhouse gases, I've heard it commonly stated, uh, it's 1.5% in the U.S., 8% globally of all greenhouse gases are from cement production. So concrete gets a bad rap for that. Uh, but the amount of social good, the amount of economic good, and the improvement that we can make can, can be really significantly reduce our environmental impact. In order to do sustainable design, you must have a life cycle perspective. You cannot just look at, hey, let's put the latest snazziest looking thing that's advertised in roads and bridges or whatever and run it out there and see how it holds up. Instead, we need to think of the whole life cycle and we need to do rigorous assessment to avoid uh, greenwashing. I can, I'm not gonna cite any specific examples, but I can tell you there are many examples of, uh, of technologies being pushed that actually are a wash or actually environmentally uh, damaging over the life cycle. You know, and I, I think as an industry, we need to challenge ourselves. 
Uh, we can do better. We can have immediate effect. We can pick some of the slow hanging fruit and we can help the uh, state meet its goals for 2025. And, you know, I always uh, say strive for longevity. Uh, with whatever we do, this is a concrete pavement on Balboa Island in California. Uh, I believe it was built, uh, this one wasn't stamped. Many of the pavements out there were built in the 30s. I believe this one is from the 20s. And uh, there's a horse stepped on it to mark itself for uh, perpetuity. And so with that, I am done with my presentation. Well, thank you, Tom. That was another fantastic presentation. Uh, while we were on here, we did receive a few questions in the Q&A uh, function over the right side of the screen, and I'll encourage anybody else who has questions to go ahead and, and uh, add them to the list, and we've got a few minutes to get to them. The first one, uh, can you please elaborate on the Chilean TC designed pavement? Yeah, basically, the, the theory of that design is that um, well, I, well, I can't, I won't zip back to it. But basically, imagine a, a pencil and you break a pencil. It's not that difficult to break a pencil. Hey man, I even have a pencil. All right, not too bad to break it once. But when you try to break it again, I did it, but it was very difficult. And I think that's the idea of the design is by going to short slabs, you significantly reduce the generation of tensile stress at the bottom of those slabs. And so therefore, we end up with um, significantly longer life that the slab itself will not break. And then by making the joints so short, the aggregate interlock, uh, the, any one joint opens very little, and so aggregate interlock is maintained. So because of that, you need a lot less um, thickness. And this work has been theoretically uh, validated. It's been validated through accelerated load testing at the University of Illinois and other places, and it has been validated in the field. And so if any of you, for example, ever get down to uh, Guatemala, and you leave Guatemala City heading up to, oh, where is that wonderful town? But anyway, you'll be driving on a one of these designs, and it's it's been there for a very, very long time with no distress. So it's, it's a design that's starting to uh, come about. Uh, one of the holding, uh, one of the problems with the design is that the design is proprietary. And so uh, that is one of the hurdles to using it. But it is being now uh, adopted by many of the big box and distribution centers. Thank you. Uh, our next question, uh, what is the best way to specify Portland limestone cement for projects? <laughs> Just basically uh, ask for an ASTMC 595 Type 1 L cement. You know, that's it. And, uh, you know, the problem with that is if that's not your spec book, it, it, it can't be uh, specified. But just so you know, this isn't something new. Uh, it's been used in the uh, uh, Europe since the 80s. Uh, it's been used uh, throughout much of the world since probably the 90s. It's uh, been in our specs since about 2010. Colorado's been using it really since about 2008. It's been available. I think we're getting very close to having it approved for use in the California standard specifications over here in California as well. And uh, based on some research at Oregon State that I, I think will be widely distributed once it's completed. Uh, another question we uh, came in, Tom. It was mentioned that slide cement is available in the Reno market, but what about Southern Nevada? Interesting. I, I have not heard of, um, you know, if someone could chip in on that, I'd be more than welcome to entertain that. I have not heard of slag coming into that market. Um, I believe there would be no barriers if it comes into the uh, Port of Los Angeles, it could be brought over. But um, I think in time, uh, it will be. Um, and, and slag is a, a, a fairly attractive cementitious material for many ways. So I think we'll see it uh, more in the market, uh, Southern Nevada as well. Yeah, I, I can't I can't speak with any certainty uh, to it either, uh, specifically for the Southern Nevada market. But I know that a couple of our uh, member companies, uh, you know, at our association, uh, do distribute slag cement, and I think they have some operations uh, in Southern Nevada. So. Uh, 
uh, I think I would encourage people to ask around to their uh, ready mix suppliers, and cement suppliers, and uh, if needed, we could probably help connect you with some folks as well. Uh, one last question before we move on today. Uh, is short joint spacing roughly equivalent with vertical reinforced concrete? Is short joint spacing roughly equivalent with what? Vertical reinforced concrete. I, I think I think they're asking about for a for a building application, like in a vertical setting for concrete as opposed to I, yeah, I would say not. <laughs> I mean, one of the critical elements about the uh, TCP is uh, you have to have very good support under it. You know, with those slabs, it's a complicated thing. And if I could, Nathan, one thing I do want to close with very quickly is those of you who are suffering fly ash shortage, it is not, even though it's an attractive option, it's not a good option just to pull your fly ash and go 100% with your Portland cement without first making sure your aggregates are, are innocuous and that you don't have sulfate issues. The, the fly ash in there is doing more than taking up the space of Portland cement. It's actually mitigating alkali silica reactivity. It's also helping to mitigate uh, sulfate issues. And so I, I, I was approached by somebody recently uh, from Southern Nevada where the contractor simply said, well, we can't get fly ash, we'll just give you 100% Portland cement mix. And that's not acceptable unless you can demonstrate uh, durability. Otherwise, you're going to start to see all of these failures reemerge uh, in 10 or 15 years. Big word of caution. We had one uh, follow-up comment uh, that came through regarding slag. Uh, somebody says, uh, haven't really haven't really needed slag in Southern Nevada much yet, as there's been plenty of Class F fly ash, but as fly ash tightens up, slag will be needed. And, and there's going to be new sources of fly ash, too. There's going to be reclaimed ash. There's going to be all kinds of... We're, we're, we're actually entering a very exciting and fun time. So buckle in. We're going to have lots of options, people, but uh, you're going to have to be doing something different. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, we're going to move on to our final presenter of